Happy New Year to all of you. In case you don't know who I'm, I am, my name is Dan. I'm also one of the pastors here. And some of you might be thinking, how many pastors do you have here? <laughs> Seriously, we're not that big of a place. Well, we actually have four. So um, it's kind of exciting. And so uh, we are all four uh, pastors uh, responsible for obviously doing pastoral things. And one of those things is obviously sharing the word. And so today's my day. I drew the lucky straw. Um, a couple of things before I get into today's message I want to update you all on. One is uh, Tara Kelly. As you all know, we have been praying for Tara. She had surgery to uh, correct all the things that had to be um, undone for her cancer treatment. Um, she is well enough. She'll be back in the office Tuesday. So praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. And so that is really, really good news. Um, and so that is just great. I'm looking forward to her having be back in the office, as I'm sure many of us are. And so praise Jesus for her healing and recovery. And so it's great to have her back on Tuesday. So today, today um, is Epiphany Sunday. Now, at Summit Ridge, we don't do a lot of what is called high church or traditional church things. Not that that's bad. It's just something we haven't always done. However, that doesn't negate the fact that for the church, that is Big C Church, that is not only what we might consider Catholic church, but also uh, Protestant churches that uh, subscribe to a more traditional approach. Uh, there is called a church calendar that is always available, that every single year is uh, updated. Every single Sunday, there are certain passages to preach from. Every single Sunday, there's oftentimes um, a theme, if you will, that goes through that. Well, one of those things here is in the church today is called Epiphany Sunday. And some of you might go, what is Epiphany Sunday? Well, I'm going to tell you what Epiphany Sunday is. Um, and there's two definitions of it. In the Western church, which in case you don't know, we are in the Western church. Okay? We are in the Western church. In the Western church, Epiphany Sunday is really um, a kind of the celebration of the incarnation of Jesus as God in the flesh, being marked by the visit of the Magi or the wise men. So this is oftentimes called King's Day or Little Christmas. So we are still in the Christmas season. Now, if we're in the Eastern church, which we are not, Eastern Church, that being Greek Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, all of those wonderful uh, faiths there as well. Uh, in, the, in the Eastern Orthodox, they would define it as the revealed Jesus Christ, as the revealed Son of God, marked by his baptism in the Jordan River. So epiphany, epiphany meaning just simply keen insight into something or someone, this is a declaration Sunday. This is a declaration of Jesus being the Son of God either revealed in his baptism or revealed by the visit of the Magi, this is a statement Sunday. And the passage that we're going to look at today, as we conclude our series in Advent, and as you all know, we're going to be tearing all of this down after the service, and if you want to stay and help us to do that, that's great. It's not as exciting as hanging all of this stuff, but it's got to be done, because it seems anticlimactic, doesn't it? I mean, all of us tomorrow are kind of maybe somewhat dreading in some trepidation the fact that everything goes back to normal, right? School starts. <laughs> uh, you know, vacation is over, though. That comes at a price. Yes. So, yeah, okay, see? Some are happy, right? Everything kind of goes back to normal. It's kind of almost anticlimactic. At least it is for me. I, you know, I kind of enjoy some of this time off. I kind of enjoy the Christmas season. But tomorrow, we face reality. So if you can stay after all that to say and help us tear down and get us back to reality after the service today, that'd be wonderful. Many hands will make light work, and so we don't anticipate that being very long for us to take all this down. However, until that time, today's passage, I think, is an appropriate passage for Epiphany Sunday. Because the passage we're going to look at today, I think, in many ways, is probably one of the best passages in all of Scripture. Certainly, I think, one of the best passages in the Gospels that highlights Jesus's reality, identity as both fully man and fully God. In today's passage, we're going to see a whole lot of man in it. We're going to see a whole lot of humanness in today's passage because 
quite frankly, for us as Christians, one of the things we have to embrace as followers of Jesus is the fact that Jesus is, and I do mean that intentionally, present tense, fully God and fully human. In other words, when Jesus ascended into heaven, he did not lose his humanness. Okay? I believe that. I do not believe that Jesus gave up his earthly body. That body was still there when he appeared to the disciples after his resurrection. In all of its, what we might consider imperfections, but what I would think are absolutely perfect because he was the perfect sacrifice. So those scars aren't imperfections. Those scars are marks of perfection, of his absolute perfect sacrifice on our behalf. And the reality is, for all of us, we have to come to grips with the fact that Jesus is both fully God and fully human. And today's passage, I think, really highlights Jesus' humanness. Jesus' is humanness. Now, I want to start off with a story to highlight this. I had a dog in high school. It's a Cocker Spaniel. I didn't like the Cocker Spaniel. I didn't like this dog in the end. And there's a reason why. Her, her name was Muffin. Uh, my grandmother and I decided to get this dog because why not? Right? So we got this dog, and this dog was a hellion. This dog was trouble. This dog did her own thing. She was a cat in, you know, in disguise, in a dog suit. That's really what this dog was, in my opinion, my humble opinion. But one of the things that really got me about this dog is this dog would take off and would be gone. I mean, there was no way of taming this dog. And so there would be periods of time where the dog would take off and my grandmother and I would have to try to go and find this dog. And it, was, it got to the point where we just said, you know what, if the dog is gone, it's gone. If it doesn't ever come back, fine. <laughs> Whatever. We can move on quite easily from this dog. Eventually, uh, my grandmother did give the dog away to a person who lived on a ranch. Perfect, perfect place for that dog. But it highlights reality of the fact of humanness in some ways about the fact is that in the world today, we lose things, don't we? We lose things. There are three things that I need before I can walk out the door of my house. One is my cell phone. One are my keys. And the last item is my wallet. If any one of those items is missing, I am not complete, right? And if any one of those items are missing, I will search long and hard to find out where those items went. Now, being my nature, I oftentimes have very specific spots, plural, where I put those things. The keys go on the key holder inside my laundry room as you come in through the garage door. That's where the keys go. They don't go on the counter. They don't go in your bedroom. If you want to keep them in your car, that's fine. It's guaranteed not to leave. You know where they're going to be, all that kind of stuff. My wallet either sits on top of my shiffer robe or by my, my light stand that's near my uh, chair in my living room, all that kind of stuff. My phone is all over the board. It's all over the map. There is no particular place. But really, if I lose any one of those three items, I'm frantically searching for it because I need them. I need them. The reality is we lose things, don't we? And not only that, we can lose people. We can lose people. We can all of a sudden not be able to find that person we need to find at the time we need to find that person. And it can be very, very frustrating, right? One of the things that I find frustrating is when I'm trying to get hold of my family members and I have my cell phone, but they don't answer theirs. Oh, you've been there. It's frustrating. I need to talk to you and I'll text them. Or I'll try calling them again and again. It just keeps going to voicemail, going to voicemail. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear my phone. Oh, I'm sorry, my phone wasn't near. Oh, you lost your phone too, right? Kind of thing. It's frustrating. But if we can lose things and we can lose people, then isn't it possible that we can lose Jesus? And what I mean by that is not losing our salvation so much as it's hard to find Jesus at times. You know, in those tough situations where we really need him, and we think, Jesus, where are you? I really need you right now. Why don't you pick up your phone kind of thing? I need to talk to you, right? Well, today's passage speaks of the fact of the humanness of both Jesus 
and his parents and the fact that his parents lost Jesus, couldn't find him. Why? Why in those moments could Mary and Joseph not find Jesus? And why, speaking to the larger context, are there times when we can't find him either? I think today's passage will share with us why and what we can do and what we need to do in order to be able to find Jesus. So today's passage, if you have a Bible with you, I invite you to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 2. I'm going to start with verse 41. And I want to read it. And then I want to go back and I want to kind of dissect it. Or as some people say, do a deeper dive into what this passage is saying. But let me read the story first, because this is a very interesting story that out of all the people who would share it, it's Luke who shares it, a Gentile, a non-Jewish person who did not know Jesus personally as one of his disciples, but yet writes this story, and he writes the following. Now, his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he became 12, that being Jesus, They went up there according to the custom of the feast. And as they were returning, after spending the full number of days, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents were unaware of it. Uh Uh-oh. But supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey, and they, uh, and sorry, and uh, went a day, uh, we're in the caravan and were unaware of it, but supposed him to be in the caravan and went a day's journey, and they began looking for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem looking for him. Then after three days, they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the teachers, both listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him, that being Jesus, were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they, his parents, saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son... Why have you treated us this way? Behold, your father and I have been anxiously looking for you. And he said to them, why is it that you were looking for me? Did you not know that I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand the statement which he had made to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth. And he continued in subjection to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus kept increasing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Now, most likely Luke got this story from Mary herself. She treasured these things in her heart. She treasured a lot of things in her heart. This was one of them. Interesting story. But this passage speaks to a lot of firsts. And only that no other gospel or for that matter, the Bible shares other than what Luke shares. For instance, these are the first words spoken by Jesus that we have after his birth. We don't have any other sayings that Jesus had prior to his birth and then his ministry. These are the first words spoken by Jesus after his birth. This is the first and only mention of Jesus between his birth and public ministry. We have no other understanding of what Jesus' upbringing was like other than this story. Everything else is assumption. Luke is the only one who gives us a window, and it's a very small window at that, into Jesus' life between his birth and the start of his public ministry. This is the first and only mention of Jesus in his childhood slash teen years. We have no other reference to Jesus as a young child, as a teenager at all in any of the other Gospels or in the Scriptures in general. This is the first mention of Jesus interacting with both of his parents. We would have interactions between Jesus and Mary, but not between Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. This is the first and, quite frankly, only interaction we have with Jesus with both his parents. This is the first and only mention of the possibility that Jesus responded in a way that might be considered wrong. Think about that. Was Jesus wrong? And yet sinless. I'll get to that in just a minute. And finally, this is the first and only insight into the family life of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. We really don't have much outside of this. 
So what do we learn about the family life of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph? Well, first of all, we notice in this passage that Jesus and his family, that being Joseph and Mary, were incredibly devout in following the law. They were pious. They were incredibly dedicated to the law. How do we know this? Because every single year they went up to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. By the way, it was not required that Mary go, only that the men go. And it was only required that the men be there for the first two days of the festival. And then they could go home. But what we read here is every single year they went up for Passover. Now, this is not unusual for families to have traditions, right? We just came off of Christmas. I'm sure we all have our traditions in Christmas, don't we? Right? We all have, even down to certain ways in which people are to open their presents, right? Some families, it's a tarot. It's, a, it's just an, a, a free-for-all, right? Everybody dives in, wrapping paper flying all over the place, gift bags now, that sort of thing, because that's easier than wrapping. I don't wrap much anymore. I use gift bags. It's much easier. Um, you know, well, it's so impersonal, Dan. Really? Is it? Would you know? I mean, come on. Give me a break. Anyways, um, there are others of you that take turns. So, you know, maybe one of the parents go first. They open up their gifts. Everybody who's in Oz, and the next parent goes, opens up their gift, and then one child goes, and then you rotate around and around. Maybe it starts from oldest to youngest or youngest to oldest, whatever it is, right? Family traditions. One of the family traditions I had growing up in Christmas was when we went to my grandmother's house, she would, she would start shopping for Christmas two days before Christmas for the next Christmas. She was that kind of person. She would shop all year long. So by the time Christmas came, she had so many gifts for everyone, it would fill up a, a good portion of her living room. But here's the thing. When we went there, that being me and my brother and my sister to celebrate Christmas, she would have the doors shut to the living room. We would have to eat dinner first. We could peer into there, but if we didn't eat dinner first, we could not open the gifts. That's just torture. But my grandmother knew if we opened the gifts, we would never eat dinner. Right? I wonder if she was secretly Greek. Right? You look hungry. Let me feed you something. Right? Even if you're not hungry. Right? Always make sure. This was no different. Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, particularly Joseph, was an incredibly devout Jewish person. And he followed the law. He followed the law, right? Here's the other thing we get into the life of Mary and Joseph, is that they cared deeply about Jesus, not because of the fact necessarily that he was the son of God, because for just the simple reason, he was their son. They cared deeply for Jesus. They loved Jesus. They loved their son. And this, quite frankly, speaks to the character of Joseph, who knew this was not his own flesh and blood son, and yet loved his son deeply. Loved his son deeply. How do we know? Jesus goes missing. Jesus goes missing. As they're at the Passover celebration in Jerusalem, and they're celebrating, obviously they would have traveled in long caravans. That would have been for both the fact that everybody was probably, was probably going there, but also with safety in numbers. It was not always safe to travel those roads in Jesus' day. And so they would go in a large caravan. And most likely everybody knew everybody. It was a family situation. So there was really no strangers among them. Uh, in these caravans. But nonetheless, here they were in Jerusalem celebrating. The celebration is over and they decide to move back and go back to, uh, to Galilee. But Jesus does not go. But at first, Mary and Joseph aren't concerned. Why? The caravan's large. He's with his friends, family, nothing to worry about. When do they become concerned? When they stop for the night and they take inventory. They have one. <laughs> it's not hard. They have one. Have you ever left your child somewhere? Right? Have you ever left your child somewhere? I, I've left my child. My child re never lets me forget it, even though that child doesn't remember it. It's only because it was shared. There's no recollection. Why? Because the child, my child, and I'm not going to out him. Oops. <laughs> My child was safe among friends. Was at the Oberons playing. 
He had no care in the world, right? Um, you know, until I got home and my wife said, well, did you bring our son? I thought he was with you. Go back and get him. He had no clue I had left him, right? This is different. They didn't leave Jesus. Jesus left them. Have you ever had a child who was, you know, a big party or whatever else, and you left, and you thought he was with you or she was with you, and they weren't? It's not that you left them. They left you. They took off and went somewhere else, and you couldn't find them. How scary is that? How scary is that? I think the message, paraphrase, I think really gets to the heart of how Mary and Joseph were feeling because when they finally went back to Jerusalem, and by the way, this took a little while, and they were searching frantically for him. How long, Luke says? Three days. That's a long time. Now, just for a moment, just entertain the thought that not only would at one point we are all answerable to God for our, for our actions at one point. Could you imagine what that conversation must have been like if, if they had not found Jesus and they had to stand before God and say, yeah, God, we lost your son. <laughs> Never mind the fact they were just concerned parents who are missing their child. This was, had an extra added stress level to it, right? Unbelievable. Jesus left them. Jesus stayed behind and didn't tell his parents that he was doing this. Have you ever had a teenager not tell you where they were going? Yeah, you know, um, <laughs> now you have an app for that, don't you? <laughs> there are parents who have apps who know exactly, get this, parents, well, how fast they're traveling in their car, where they are going. All this, they can track you now. It's really hard. They didn't have that, obviously, back then, right? Didn't tell Mary and Joseph where he was going. He just... He just stayed. And I, the message paraphrase, I think, gets to the heart of this. When they finally found him after three days of searching, and although they're astonished, they're really upset. In fact, Mary's words, as shared by the paraphrase, is this. Young man, why have you done this to us? Your father and I have been half out of our minds looking for you. In fact, that's really what that word anxious in the scriptures, it's unbelievable stress that they were going through trying to find Jesus in Jerusalem during Passover. Do you think it was a rather busy place? Oh, absolutely. When do kids go missing in exact situations like this? Large crowds at some sort of festival or celebration or even in the mall or something like that, right? I remember one time my cousin um, uh, went missing and my aunt and I were in the store and it was part of a, you know, it was a busy store. It was busy shopping season. It was crowded. And my aunt was freaking out. And she told me, and this is what you do, right? Dan, you go stand at the front door. And eventually we found him. He was just moseying. He was two years old. He was <laughs> checking things out. He had no care in the world. That's how he is today. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's a party. Let's just go, right? We can have some fun. It's out of your mind. My aunt was freaking out. Serious. They cared deeply. They being Mary and Joseph for Jesus. They loved Jesus. Not just because he was the son of God, because he was their son under their care. They cared deeply and they were, we would move heaven and earth to find him. As any concerned, loving parent would do when they cannot find their child. They will do anything in the world to find their child. Here's the other thing about family life that we discover about Mary and Joseph and Jesus, that there was a lack of fully understanding on Mary and Joseph's part of who Jesus is and Jesus not fully understanding his responsibility as a son. Imagine that. Why do I say that? Well, because of Jesus' response. And obviously, tone is hard to read in Scripture. We can't read tone in Scripture. But Jesus' response is anything but, oh, Mom and Dad, I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's rather, well, why, did you, why did you think I'd be anywhere else except here? In my Father's house. As though, duh. <laughs> Let me ask you something. 
if your child ever responded to you and said, uh, mom and dad, why didn't you think, why didn't you not know that I would be at this, pl- at this location at my friend's house or, or over here at the batting cage or whatever else that your child is interested in? Why don't you think to look there? Duh. How would you receive that? Let me ask you a question. Was Jesus wrong? Interesting, right? Was Jesus wrong? Because for us as humans, it's hard for us to put wrongness without equating wrongness with sinfulness. And we know that Jesus was not sinful. He was sinless, but that doesn't mean he couldn't be wrong. For instance, let me give you an example. Have you ever taken a wrong turn? Was that sinful? Did you at night say, oh Jesus, I am so sorry, I confess for the wrong turn I took on the, on the freeway or the wrong exit. I missed my turn. No, it's just you were wrong. You weren't sinful. You didn't intentionally do it. There was no nefarious or evil intent by taking this wrong turn. You just took a wrong turn. Have you ever spilt something or dropped a plate of food? Right? Is that sinful? Well, unless you intended to drop it on someone intentionally. No, it just happens. And this is the part I think as Christians we struggle with. Could Jesus be wrong and yet not sinful? I think it's possible. I think it's absolutely possible for Jesus to be a teenager. For him to be a young person. For him to actually experience, because the scriptures do say he was tempted in every way. And guys, teenager guys, a lot of temptation. I think very possible. Jesus was a typical teenager. And there were things that he got wrong, not intentionally, not for any other evil reason. And that's why I believe it's sinless, not sinful. He just unaware. Now we get that. No, no, Jesus is God. He's got to be fully aware. Well, but he limited himself in this. How do I know this? Well, two things. One is after this incident, what did Jesus do? Yes, he went home. In fact, the scriptures here say he subjected himself. Ooh, it's rather strong. To his parents' authority. In other words, if mom and dad say, you need to come home with us, son, Jesus didn't say, mm, I answer to a higher authority than you. <laughs> I think we would have had the first beating in scripture here. You know, spare the rod, spoil the child, right? Kind of thing. Ooh, I don't think Mary and Joseph would have done that. They're very devout kind of thing. No, 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 no. Jesus didn't do that. He went with his parents and he subjected himself to their authority. He remained obedient to them. And number two is this. He continued to grow, as the scriptures tell us here, in what? Wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. In other words, Jesus as a 12-year-old was just on the cusp of turning 13, and at 13 years old, in the Jewish tradition, you begin serious, rigorous training in the scriptures and in the law. That is where you have your bar mitzvah. That's where one becomes a boy into a man. That is a whole host of things. Jesus was growing. And although he knew a lot, he didn't know everything yet. And although he he was uh, just astounding the religious leaders with his answers and questions, it showed he yet had to grow. Still, Jesus is fully human. Now, the question is, why didn't Mary and Joseph find Jesus right away? Why did they struggle for three days finding Jesus? I think the answer is fairly simple, and it's this. And I think it speaks to the larger reason why some people struggle finding Jesus Mary and Joseph, I believe, struggled finding Jesus because they didn't know who Jesus is. They didn't know fully who Jesus is. And because they didn't know fully who Jesus is, they didn't know where to look. Because they did not know fully who Jesus is, they didn't know where to look. They didn't know where to look. Had they known, oh yeah, Jesus is not just our son. He's the son of God. Son of God, he's got this ministry. He's going to eventually be doing. He's going to be, you know, obviously die on the cross. Um, Let's check the temple. 
right? I don't know where they looked in Jerusalem, but it was probably pretty clear they didn't look at the temple first. They probably looked everywhere else. Where are the teenage boys playing? Go look there first. Where are the teenage boys hanging out? Go look there first. Chances are, Mary and Joseph, I would not be surprised, we don't know, probably one of the last places they looked finally was the temple because who in their right mind would find a teenage boy in school in the most boring place that a teenager boy would probably find to be the most boring place among the teachers and the scribes and the doctors in talking about the law? <laughs> There's a story, um, former speaker Paul Ryan, um, he is a political junkie, and when he was a teenager, he got in trouble. Do you know why? He crawled out of his window at night to go and watch C-SPAN. <laughs> political, who does that? He wasn't going to go be with a girl. He wasn't going to go with his friends and go around. No, no, he wanted to watch C-SPAN of the political hearings going on. Listen, I like C-SPAN too at times, but it's boring a lot. It's great to sleep to. <laughs> Just crazy. Listen, Mary and Joseph didn't know fully who Jesus is. And why do we know this? Because Luke says it. Verse 50, but they, Mary and Joseph, did not understand the statement which Jesus made to them. And the statement Jesus said is, why didn't you think that I would not be in my father's house? Another way of saying that is Jesus saying to them, why didn't you think I would be about my father's business? doing the things that my father has called me to do. You should have known this, but they didn't because they didn't fully understand or grasp who Jesus is. And I think this speaks to the larger context of why people can't find Jesus. And even in the New Testament, there are countless, it seems like, not countless, but many examples of Jesus being missed all the time for who he truly is because people don't know fully who he is, and therefore they don't know where to look. The Pharisees never saw Jesus as truly the Son of God, and they never got it. They couldn't understand why he would be eating with tax collectors and sinners, why they would find Jesus there, or the Son of God there, or the Savior of the world there. He, the Savior of the world ought to be in the temple. The Savior of the world ought to be with the religious leaders, but that's not where they found Jesus, Right? Saul, probably one of the best conversion stories ever, never thought of looking for Jesus. No, no, he was looking for Jesus' followers. And just by chance, Jesus showed up. He never thought that Jesus would ever be there with his followers. He never thought that Jesus would be even with him. Why? Because Paul didn't know fully who Jesus is. Peter walking on water. What a great thing. The disciples were freaked out when they saw him walking on water to them in a boat that was being overcome by waves in the midst of a storm. And they were shocked. No, no, it's a ghost. Really? Why did they say these things? Because they didn't understand fully who Jesus is. And in the moment that they needed him, when he shows up, they didn't immediately recognize him. People miss Jesus all the time. They miss Jesus all the time. Do you know who didn't miss Jesus? The woman hemorrhaging for years. She had no problem finding him. Zacchaeus had no problem finding Jesus. He was just only hoping that Jesus would find him, would notice him, and he did. Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, had no problem finding Jesus. Friends of the paraplegic man who dug a hole in the roof to lower this man down to Jesus had no problem finding where Jesus is. Roman leaders, military leaders, had no problem finding Jesus. Why? Because they knew who he was. And if you know who Jesus is, you know exactly where to look. If you know who Jesus is, you know exactly where to look. So where is Jesus? Where is Jesus? 
I think for us, we have to understand that Jesus is in the most unexpected places that we individually may, ever, may never think that Jesus would ever be. Chances are that's where Jesus is. That's where Jesus is. Why? Because Jesus told us that's where he would be. Jesus said these words. He said, and I'm paraphrasing, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but whom? The sick. The sick. And I have come for the sick. In case you don't realize this, we're all sick. We are all in need of a doctor. Jesus is among those who need a doctor. That's where Jesus is. So what does that mean for us? This is what I think it means in some ways where Jesus is. He is in the most unexpected places with the most un, un, unexpected people that we could possibly never think that Jesus would ever be with. That's where Jesus is. Jesus is among the poor. Jesus is among the forgotten, the sick, the disadvantaged. He is among broken marriages and hurting families. He is among those who are hurting from loss and who are grieving. He is with those who are looked over. He is with those whom you probably in your own life can't stand. He is with them. He is with people who have done unbelievable harm to individuals and even beyond that, he is with them. Serial killers, terrorists, non-Christians. That's where Jesus is. And if we don't understand that, even as followers of Jesus, we will miss him. We will miss him. Because Jesus is in the unexpected places. And that unexpected places is different for each and every one of us. For some, it might be hard for us to imagine Jesus among people who aren't Christians. Terrorists. Islamists. Wherever. For others, it might be that particular family member who we just can't stand, that parent who did irreparable harm to us. Jesus is there. Jesus is with the sick. And if we want to find him, that's where we need to go. That's where we need to go. Jesus is in the places and with the people that sometimes we are all too easy to want to write off and to want to dismiss. Chances are that's where Jesus is. And for each and every one of us, it's different who we think Jesus ought to write off or who we just can't stand and tolerate. That's where Jesus is. So maybe you're here today and you can't find Jesus and you need him. You may be hurting. You may need him for whatever reasons, and it's hard, and you wonder, where is he? I want to tell you, he's right here. He's among the sick. He's among those who need a savior. He's among those who, in the midst of their brokenness, in the midst of their grieving, in the midst of their hurt, he is here. In the midst of the doubters, in the midst of of those that we can't even stomach, he is here. He is here. And if we just simply look in those places, we'll find him. We'll find him. And he will show up in ways that might be unexpected to us because we never thought Jesus would do that. But if we think about it, it's like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Jesus is here. Father, I am grateful that you have come not for the healthy, but for the sick. And Jesus, I admit and confess that I am not well, that I too am broken, that I too hurt, that I too grieve, that I too have my biases, my judgments, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry for the times that I have missed you working in areas of people's lives, Jesus, because I have written those areas or those people off. 
Jesus, I am grateful that you are here. I am grateful that you are present, that you want to be found, and that you can be found. I pray that you would instill in us this heart and this awareness of where you're working. And that we'd be willing to join you there. Thank you, Jesus. It's your name that we pray. Amen.